happy 2017 to all my friends and listeners and supporters of the show. I hope you all had a fantastic year. I had a pretty exciting one myself, and I'm looking forward to all the exciting upcoming developments in 2017. This is the 37th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Got a really interesting interview for you today. You know, I pride myself in having a breadth of knowledge, uh, some depth of knowledge on some issues, but I'm pretty familiar with nearly any worldview that I encounter. But this interview, I encountered some ideas that I, I don't think I've actually encountered anywhere else. It was very stimulating and provocative. I have a lot to think about, and I'm really looking forward to doing the breakdown of this interview. But right now, contrary to any of the other breakdowns, I don't exactly know what I'm going to say. I'm still thinking about some of the issues that my guest brought up in this interview. So I'm joined today by Professor Mario De Caro, who teaches philosophy at the University of Rome in Italy, but he's also a frequent visiting professor at Tufts University in Massachusetts, and that's where I met up with him. Fascinating fact about Professor De Caro, he actually has an asteroid named after him. That's right, the asteroid 5329 De Caro is named after my guest, which is pretty dang cool. Our conversation started talking about free will, and the philosophy of mind, and about half an hour into it, we start getting into talking about causation and the metaphysics of causation. We started talking about his ontological beliefs, where if you guys have been listening to the show, you know I'm a dualist. And Professor DeCaro is a pluralist. He's both a metaphysical pluralist. He believes that, yes, there is mind and matter, and there's other different types of categories of existence. And he's also a causal pluralist. So there's not just physical causes for things. There might be biological or psychological or sociological or mental causes for things, neither of these things being able to be reduced to one another. So it was a really, really fascinating interview. And like I said, I don't know my own perspective on this topic. I, I like a lot of the things they had to say, and I'm still working on integrating this into my own worldview. The audio begins just after the beginning of our conversation, after he explained to me what he sees as the importance and the implications of whether or not we have free will. I think it is fair to say it has huge implications, both in terms of how we might structure a legal system, how we think about ourselves, how we think about the concepts of responsibility, what we are as human beings. If people have never encountered the question of whether or not we have free will, I would suspect the first time they hear it, they go, of course, of course we have free will. I mean, yeah, what do you mean? Can I make free decisions? Yes, of course. And then when you, but when you start unpacking that, well, if that's true, how is that possible and what does it imply? It becomes this really sticky issue. Mm -hmm. So how can we better understand the difficulties presented by free will specifically that we do have free will? Let's take the scenario we do have free will. Why, why shouldn't everybody just go, of course, it's an empirical question. Look, I can do all kinds of things voluntarily. Case closed. Okay. Uh, Two things. Uh, before answering, let me say that there are studies now about what the folk intuition is about free will. So, and the question is there is there are still controversies there. If we think that free will requires determinism or requires indeterminism. So there are different studies and per this will be solved at some point what the folk intuition is. But that's of course doesn't settle the, the issue you are asking. The first thing to understand, I think, is that there is no one question of free will. Uh, that's that's uh, just wrong. There are several questions, a galaxy of questions, and some of these questions are purely conceptual, and some others also need some empirical research or confirmation or falsification of the uh, conceptual uh, hypothesis. Um, so let me give some uh, some examples. The first question that's very controversial is, what is free will? Mm. And I, I will go back because that was the sense of your question. But there are others. Um, is free will compatible with determinism or with indeterminism or with both or with neither? Other question. Is free will uh, a, the condition of possibility of moral responsibility, of legal responsibility? This is another question. And there are others uh, that I could keep going. All these are different. Because, of course, if you say the question, what is free will, is a conceptual question. Mm -hmm. And scientists are very rough. Sometimes the scientists I was mentioning, not all of them, but many of them, even very famous ones, when they write these books saying there is no free will, they don't really, are not very accurate in defining what is free will. Okay. That's, that's an important point, sure. of course. But even when you are defined, uh, for example, there are many people who think that free will requires determinism, and some other that say, no, it does require 
indeterminists. These are empirical commitments for mm -hmm. these views. So if you uh, hold one of these views, you also have empirical commitments. So uh, what I suggest in this case is, is that you should look, I have a good conceptual analysis of the issue and then in some cases you have to look at what science tells us about those but okay. you cannot disconnect the two, the two fields entirely so if we could try to be relatively precise what is free will yeah okay so the first question is uh one idea that was uh, obvious uh, to common sense of philosophy until let's say kant excluded is the idea that it's obvious that we have some kind, to most philosophers, that we have this idea of shaping our own destiny because we are not determined by anything. Think about Descartes. Descartes had uh, this idea, he wrote that the idea that I'm free is one of the most basic and correct belief I have. Why? Be well, because for him, uh, belief applies to the mind, and the mind is a totally disconnected from the physical world, mm -hmm. ontological, ontologically. So there is no... Uh, constrained by the mind, by, by the mother on the mind. So the mind can be um, understood as causa sua in some sense. There was also, for, for Descartes, notoriously, uh, mind and soul are the same thing. The mind for Descartes is infinite, immaterial, indivisible, and other properties. Mm -hmm. So it's an old-fashioned idea of the mind. When one abandons this and tries to connect the mind with the body, the problem begins. Right. And I think the best expression of the problem of free will in the modern age is given by Immanuel Kant in the Critic of Pure Reason, in his famous third antinomy. Antinomies are um, oppositions or theses that appear both true. So, for example, the two beliefs here are for Kant. Oh, of course I'm true. I'm free. I'm free of doing, uh, shaping my life. And when I'm free, I'm responsible. And the other is the same for the others. I, it's obvious that uh, in some occasion, not all the time, of course, in some uh, occasions, people are free, act freely and responsibly. So they, you know, have the moral responsibility of what they do. This is obvious. This is the thesis of the antinomy. But there is an antithesis. Where is this, the space of this freedom in a world that for Kant is the, world, the Newtonian world, in which everything is determined by the past and the laws of nature. So he has this big opposition and his solution famously, and famously unsatisfactorily, in my opinion, is that we cannot think of free will in the phenomenal world, in the world of phenomena, in the world studied by science. We have to locate free will in the world of noumena, the world in which we can only conceive, but we cannot really experience directly. Uh, there are many problems there with this dualism. The first is that the world of Newman is out of space and time, and I cannot understand what an idea of causation or mm -hmm. f cause uh, freedom in causing our actions could be if there is not for a space and time there. So that's my unsatisfaction with Kant. But the problem is that it is still with us in some sense. So what was interesting when you were um, explaining that is Descartes' position, do you think that free will becomes a non-issue if you accept a kind of radical substance dualism? When it's like, okay, well now we, now we have no trouble. It's only when you try to connect uh, no, the mind and body. Certainly there is a big problem, problem when you try to connect it. Right. Uh, but there, is, there are problems, even if Descartes denied it, uh, even in the other case. So if you have, let's say, if you locate freedom in the spiritual world. And the most famous version of this is, there are others, but the most famous famous one is the theological problem of free will. Because Descartes himself thought that uh, uh, an inf omnipotent, uh, uh, omniscient uh, God uh, has created this world. And he knows what time we are going to do. And perhaps he even intervenes. So that, so that menace to freedom there is not the laws of nature but God's properties. Mm. There is a famous problem there. Um, for example, Luther and Calvin, when they you know, uh, started the Reformation, wrote two books against the idea of free will that was basic in the Catholic Church. When Luther wrote a book called The Bound Will and uh, uh, Calvin one on predestination. So both theorized that uh, our moral actions, at least that's what interests them, uh, 
are not up to us really. So it's already established if we'll go to heaven or hell. There is no free will that can save us there. So theological questions aside, is there a room then? So let's take a substance dualist position that makes no claims about God. Mm -hmm. Just the mind is completely in a different ontological realm than the rest of space-time. If that were the case, now that obviously comes with a whole host of other issues, but in regards to free will, what are there any issues that arise? So, Because if I were to say something like, I think this is a bad argument, but somebody could make the argument that it is definitely the case that we have free will, that we act freely, and if that's the case, it must therefore be to avoid any extreme complex difficulty that the mind must be in this uh, this other place sure. disconnected from space-time. So it's an argument for dualism from free will. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, it, but of course, uh, even if we forget about God there, that's not so easy because and that's generally normally interpreted in a, a theological scenario or framework. Uh, there is an obvious problem. That is the problem of all forms of radical dualism. How can the mind interact with the with the material ma uh, world? Right. There are, you know, if the the mind is totally independent in this scenario, but that's not what we think when we think of our freedom. We think that we make changes exactly. in the physical world, and also we are, of course, influenced causally influenced by the physical world. No uh, defender, the mo the most extreme libertarian wouldn't deny that we, our beliefs and our desires are influenced, perhaps not determined, but that's still influenced by how we perceive the world with the, through the senses. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is how can this ontologically uh, independent mind interact with the physical world? The solutions are very unsatisfactory there. Right. One is, of course, the cult uh, pineal gland that's yeah, right. almost unbearable because the pineal gland of course is in the physical world so the problem is simply located but it's not solved right uh, but then there are others more promising but very very metaphysical like parallelism mm -hmm. the one uh, or pre-established harmony or occasionalism so are all views in which it's a sort of miracle that the mind that the world go in parallel right uh, in some cases they simply are independent it looks to us that they are um, interacting with each other but justice God that has set the world settled the world in the way that it seems to us that things go together the mind and the, the physical world proceed together but that's just God has decided that that's the case it's not that there is any interaction now one popular argument um, when people are talking about the relationship between consciousness and external reality, it comes from quantum physics. Perhaps imprecisely so. People say, ah, now we've discovered this. This might be the answer to the interaction problem. Mm -hmm. We have consciousness that causally collapses the wave function. It actually makes an impact, and this is the mechanism mm -hmm. by which it does it. Do you find arguments for free will from quantum physics compelling? No, I mean, it's so taken it said uh, a terrible argument and uh, <laughs> uh, and there are several things to say here first of all it's it's not completely correct to say that quantum mechanics uh, uh, has been proved that the, the subatomic world is indeterministic because there are important interpretations of quantum mechanics like the Bohmian or the mm -hmm. uh, the Bohmian uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics that are deterministic they give up uh, the issue, the, the thesis or locality of the physical phenomena, so phenomena can influence each other even if they don't are not connected in, in space, but they are deterministic. So it's not easy there. It, there is a lot to discuss, and there are also other interpretations that are deterministic but not local. But besides that, there are other issues. First, it's not clear, simply it's not clear, if uh, at the level of neurophysiology, quantum indeterminacies are relevant or not. So it's empirically unclear. But let's assume they are. Uh, let's assume that, you know, there are indeterministic events in the brain. This is what, for example, for the famous physicist, physicist Roger Penrose, is the explanation of uh, free will. And that's uh, almost a non sequitur, I think. Um, first of all, there is the famous objection that was famously made by 
Hume, but by many others, including at some point even Hobbes. Uh, so the idea is that if you simply have indeterminism, this doesn't amount to freedom at all, because uh, let's assume that uh, this would say would mean something like that. I have to make a choice. So I am in a restaurant and they ask me, do you want pizza or pasta? If indeterminism is located in a way in which my choice is not determined, I would be free to choose one of the two without any determination. So let's assume that I choose pasta. Well, but I was totally indetermined there, right? Because if I was determined, there is no indeterminism. Right? This means that if the world goes back exactly to that moment, I could have chosen the other. Um, I could have chosen uh, pizza. Did I say pasta? Yeah. Now I can choose, choose pizza. But look, I am exactly myself in the same mental states with all my history, my desires, my present uh, uh, mental states. And I decide in, in other case, indifferently. And so it's not really up to me. It's not, I'm not the sufficient reason of what happens there after that. I'm not causing what happens there because my exactly myself, the presence of myself and my decisions is compatible with uh, two different alternative, actually, states of affairs. So it's not me. It's just random what will happen. That's the typical argument. Right. There's a so-called replay argument, right? Replay is called the mind argument by Wagen because many articles of this kind have been published in the journal Mind. Uh, you can also rephrase it with possible worlds. Perhaps it's even clearer. So you have uh, your twin uh, replica, uh, you're the twin Steve on uh, Twin Earth. And so the past and the laws of nature of this twin earth are exactly like ours until the moment in which you choose between pasta, pizza and pasta. You choose pizza and twin Steve choose pasta. Everything else up to that moment is the same. And you are absolutely identical to twin, uh, twin Steve. So it's not you or Steve who decides what to do. It's random. So this is, uh, so the most, uh, you, according to some, uh, I think this is too strong. Indeterminism is incompatible with free will. That's perhaps too much. It could be that is, but the most you can get there that perhaps has to be proved is compatible with free will, but certainly is not sufficient. You need something else. So agent causation, for example, uh, agent causalists try to add some agential powers that can, mm -hmm. you know, be based on this indeterminism and try to govern what they do. But that's difficult. There is, for example, this famous philosopher, Robert Kane, who has written a book in which he doesn't mention any peculiar causal powers of the agents. He only mentions uh, event causation. So there are some indeterminate events in the, in the brain, and the same as um, Penrose. These indeterminate events in the brain are enough to justify the idea we choose freely. But then he doesn't have a satisfactory argument. Uh, for replying to my obje my objection, it's a general objection. And there was a, f a review by Al Mealy to this famous book by the by uh, the Sif significance of free will by uh, Robert Kane. Mealy noticed that at one point of the book, Kane uh, uh, um, said that exactly in the same situations, I would choose the same way. A few pages after, he said exactly in the same situations, I could do something else. So. Yeah, because he's torn between the two alternatives, but neither works. Okay, so let's explore the determinist route here. Is it possible, then, that determinism is true and you still have meaningful free will? Yeah, that seems the much more promising. I used to say that I, when I was younger, I sympathized with the idea of libertarianism, but then I'm convinced that it doesn't really work much. And also, I don't think it's needed to have such a heavy metaphysics there because the only way is trying to say you know the agent causation agent causation is something special and all these things and try to elaborate a very uh, complicated emergentist view of the universe if you don't want pure dualism of course so i gave up uh, libertarianism and now i'm more sympathetic to uh, freedom there is an idea to, to uh, compatibilist freedom uh, there is an idea that uh, Dan Dennett has defended. So the idea is this. We have intuitions about free will that are, you know, all uh, common sense intuitions fr frequently are confused or partially contradictory. But we should, as philosophers, try to understand what is worth wanting in this 
in these situations. And what is working, and I think that's uh, the correct idea, is to find an idea of free will that is sufficient to justify our attributions of responsibility to each other. And I would add also perhaps uh, attributions of uh, rationality or to people or to ourselves. Uh, in order to be rational, we have to make choices in a sense that is compounded. Uh, it has to be, uh, it couldn't be done by a computer that answer without uh, uh, any rational analysis of what the situation is. So rationality also, I think, it, it depends on some idea of free will. Uh, responsibility, rationality, perhaps dignity are all dependent. And what's cl what is crucial here is the idea that we are sensible to reasons. That is the crucial process. So when we when is that we attribute responsibility for actions? When people uh, were understanding what was at stake, were understanding what the predictable consequences of the actions were, were what the moral course of action should have been, all these things. This is rational reasoning. And in most cases, we are sensible to this uh, kind of considerations and reasons. So that the framework where we should set the question. It's not a, in my opinion, metaphysics doesn't help here. It's not that you should find, you know, force a special agent in the universe starting to talk about supervenience or grounding. Or, no, look at the practices. And there, what really matters is when we are responsive to reasons. That seems to be the crucial point. Some people are responsive, some, some are not. We know, right? If you have um, kleptomania, you can't really help yourself. You will steal. If you don't and you steal, uh, you are responsible, I think. That's interesting. It, it, doesn't that kind of put the cart before the horse, though? So there are these other periphery things that are very important, but the whole, in my mind, the whole issue of free will is the metaphysical discussion. It is mm -hmm. whether or not we are those actual causal agents and that all the other conclusions that follow that from that seem like they're of secondary importance when you say that the, the uh, rationality for example comes from free will well we shouldn't even care about that in, in my mind unless we're these mm -hmm. these causal agents you know okay it seems like that's the central really the central issue i see but what i wouldn't I, what i probably disagree with you on this is this idea of causation as something that is there, out there, independent of our interest when uh, when we think about the world. So there is, I think you have in mind, perhaps, and tell me if I'm wrong in interpreting what you're saying, some kind of basic causation that is the physical one, and then everything, other forms of causation have to supervene or depend or on that kind of causation, right? That's it, your... it seems to be the case. That yeah. just is in, in accordance with my experiences, I would say. Oh, yeah. Is this your experience? I doubt that this is your experience. My impression <laughs> that this is your philosophy. Okay, yes. <laughs> I don't... <laughs> That's see... your point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so what is the... Uh, that is an, uh, the idea that... Uh, of a strong form of mo ontological monism here, right? So um, causality is fundamentally one and has to be reduced to the microphysical level, uh, but and then it's already something is complicated there because of course in physics people don't really talk about causes. So it's, there is al always something strange in this attempt to reduce all causation to co physical causation where our physicists don't care about causation. But anyway, le besides that, is this the case? Let's assume that I take this example by philosopher that I, I admire a lot. I've been working with him a lot. So Hilary Patram. Ha Patram asks, let's take, uh, for example, a simple example. So someone uh, has a stroke. And so we have to ask, uh, why? And the metaphysician says, oh, there is, of course, there is uh, one explanation that, you know, the fundamental causal mechanisms there that explains everything. Is this true? Is this the idea that there is an explanation on quantum mechanics level that is the explanation of this phenomenon? I strongly doubt, and Patron did strongly doubt, and I think you in fundamentally also strongly doubt that. So I think that, as Patron says, there are as many causes are causes. So it depends on what interest you have when you ask why, um, what is the, re the causal change you are looking at. Well, yes, but when you go that route, it seems to pull you, at least in terms of theoretical explanation for phenomena, into a dualism. When we're saying, so for example, if we're watching like a billiard game, 
yeah. what was the cause of the billiard ball knocking into the balls? Well, it was this force and that physical force, or, oh, well, it was the person's life choices that brought that they decided they wanted to go to the pool hall and take up a career being yeah, a that's Yeah, uh, that's, I don't think it doesn't, uh, uh, I see what you mean, but uh, let me put it in this way. What's, uh, uh, so let's analyze the case of the stroke, right? Yeah. So some person is saying, it depends really who you are in asking the question, right? Because if, you know, someone says, okay, oh, you know, John had a stroke. The other one says, why? And you respond, oh, of course, there is, um, you know, the micro Atom subatomic entities, uh, blah, blah, blah. You go on, and that looks like, you, are you crazy? Okay, so let's go to the regular one. So if you are a physiologist, you could say something like, uh, uh, you know, there was some uh, um, uh, physiological phenomenon, and so the blood was uh, blocked and blah, blah, blah. That's an explanation. But if you are, uh, you know, you are the insurance, you are not interested in that. <laughs> you are interested in other things like, uh, did he take his medications? Or uh, did he do what the doctor said? Or if you are, let's assume that you are the widow and the widow could think, oh, that was my fault because, you know, yesterday I cooked an incredible dinner and um, he ate, you know, two dishes of pasta and then he had that 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 too much too much i knew i shouldn't have done it's my fault is this wrong doesn't seem to me that this is wrong it's a legitimate point of view or even could say oh you know what uh, i've been be, i've been refusing to go with him to run he insisted every time i didn't want to go so he didn't do his exercise and that's still my fault now how can you account for that for these kind of things if you only think that there is a basic kind of causation, why there should be? So what is the idea here? That uh, there is really out there a, a causal distribution of forces that would account for all this? Isn't this a scientist in dream? Well, uh, would you not say that those additional explanations could all be reduced? No, that's a dream, I think. What is this kind of reduction? Well, well, think about the famous uh, argument by Patram. The, uh, Patram has this famous argument, you know it perhaps, so there is this, uh, uh, think about a hole one inch and two pegs, one is circular, just uh, uh, one uh, up, little, little smaller, the, the, the uh, diameter, and it fits it. If it's a square section of this peg and it's exactly a uh, little smaller, it doesn't go there. There is, Patlam is right, there is no physical explanation of why. It's only geometrical. You need to go to an upper level to explain. There is no possible physical explanation of this phenomena. And the same upset there, his example is this. Do you really think that the French Revolution in principle could be explained by the arrangement of the universe? What kind so, of dream is this? Well, so imagine, imagine that we had a insane amount of information, just volumes and volumes about the position and location of every physical constituent bit in the universe, yeah. or at least on Earth. Yeah. You don't think there would be enough information No, there would be too the... much. That's the point. There would be, in one side, I well, don't think... maybe it... we couldn't sort through it, but no, at no. least in principle, no, all the I information think would be No, I think there wouldn't be, be enough, captured. and at, sense, at the same time, wouldn't be enough, it would be too much. It wouldn't be enough because you really need to refer to intentions and not because they are in principle independent of matter, but because they give a different uh, kind of causal link that is the relevant one. But the, it's too much. In order to individuate the uh, relevant, in, let's assume that you are uh, as smart as uh, Laplace's genius. In order to individuate the relevant causal uh, uh, mechanisms at the subatomic level you can't you can't avoid to use the upper level how can you identify what is relevant there well, you I, always depend on the other so let's say it's uh, it's like learning another language some people can read computer code and they they can sort through and kind of meta put together what's happening with the computer code this would just be like a gigantic a, a code that they could read yeah that seemed to me the cr you know scientists don't really think this is only philosophers that have this positivistic <laughs> dream i mean i don't think a physicist really think of, of you know explaining uh the theory of natural selection 
by looking and just thinking there is an explanation hidden there. Well, it's because they can't read the computer code, though. They can't, they... Even there, there are no polymon uh, polynomial problems that we can, won't ever, ever be able, no one would ever, ever be able uh, to solve any, even in the, the would you, because calculating these uh, problems, solving these problems would be, would need more time than the length of the universe. Okay, so let me ask you a couple questions on this. Does that mean that there are actual causal forces that are in addition? to the base level phenomenon. No, what I'm saying is that I would be anti-realistic here. I don't think there is a causal um, uh, structure of the world that is out there and, is, uh, and we are just not smart enough to understand. So um, I don't think there is any scientific evidence, uh, for example, that this is the case. Uh, for example, let's take the uh, classic new, uh, uh, it's called new human interpretation of causation. What is, for example, Davidson on Hempel? What is a causal link? Is a uh, any you can describe it in all the terms you want, but it always amounts exactly in what you are saying here to the idea that there are two events, physical events, connected by a law. That's what is it, right? A law. Mm -hmm. It's called New Human because the law is what ba uh, founds everything. So. You th really people think, I don't think that's the case, that there are uh, laws that connect all causal events. The causation is much more complicated. Think about the books by uh, Nancy Cartwright, for example, about many people, uh, Gallison or Gear. This idea that there are laws of this kind is just fiction. So what's your explanation for what causation is? Yeah, causation is something that is not as regular as philosophers try to think. There are. Laws are idealizations, are not out there, the laws of physics, as many philosopher of science have tried to say. If it's so, the idea that Davidson and Hempel had is just an idealization itself. So it's not true that every time you have a causal uh, relation, there is a connection between physical events that explain that causal uh, relation. I don't think, I think this is an idealization. Pragmatically, it's not the case. What we have is, you know, regularities that we try to understand in di different ways. But this but idea... don't the regularities have some kind of actual causal link between them? It's not just... Yeah, yeah but the one thing is, uh, you know, actual causal link, generalizations, and this... The other idea that you can reduce all these generalizations to a physical structure of the world where there are always precise, determined uh, physical laws. That, I think, is a dream. It's, I'm not saying that. Philosophers of science are saying that. <laughs> okay. But so in your, in your worldview, the, the, when I'm talking about causality, I'm loosely talking about the, that cause and effect relationship, that when I perceive some phenomena in time, there's time two, there's this perception that I'm having, there's time one, there's another perception, and there seems to be this link that when I, you know, if I push a bottle on a table over, it seems to fall, and there's this regularity, of, okay, that there's some... There's some internal coherence to external phenomena. Sure. So that requires explanation. Sure. So... Why only physical explanation? That's my question. Uh, uh, so, quite frankly, I am a dualist. Oh, <laughs> even a, a dualist. I am a substance dualist. Okay, yes, so, no, I'm way, I'm way yeah, out there, yeah, but, yeah, uh, but yeah. I want to explore Yeah, but this. it depends yeah. also substance dualism, honestly. Depends what you mean. In some sense, I'm a pluralist, so... Okay. I'm a pluralist too. I, when you say substance dualist, so you have all this metaphysical idea of emergence and blah blah blah. That I am a little. No, I, I actually don't, I don't. It's not about emergence. So yeah, exactly. The, the, the most then, precise way to articulate it for me is I'm not a physicalist. Okay, I'm not either. <laughs> okay, so, so. No, I'm not either. I don't think that physics can, even in principle, explain everything that happens. Right. Uh, so we are on the same. <laughs> uh, uh, I think on, on in the same group here. Um, so I'm. I think it's a legend that there are out there are laws that explain, can in principle explain all causal relations we care of, either directly or indirectly through a reduction. Because also this reduction, think about this, think about Davidson, because this is a very clear example, right? Every mental uh, state I am in it corresponds to a physical state, and this physical state is the cause of another physical state, for example, the states that I uh, cause in the world when I act. Right? So the causal relation is at the most basic level, at the physical level. Uh, all these reductions are, how, what are you saying? What, 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 how could you reduce? All the attempts to reduce 
intentional states, normative states to non-intentional states don't really work. Well, let me ask you, if we take the mind out of this, and in your own worldview, when we're just analyzing physical phenomena, so the bottle being pushed over on the table, I'm not trying to reduce all phenomena to physical law, but what is your explanation for what causality is in that kind of circumstance? I mean, re repeat, they, they, we shouldn't forget that science, especially the physical sciences, don't use causality a lot. So this idea of explaining causality, oh, you know, causality is really at the physical level. It's not. There is no causality there. Causality is something that um, connections, regularities between phenomena that we see in the world and try to understand, seeing causal relationships that, of course, there are, but I repeat, there is no one fundamental for form of causation. That okay. seems to me, I'm a causal pluralist. Okay, so what? let's maybe take the word physical out of it. So if you're a causal pluralist, what are, what is the causality? So for something like just a purely physical phenomenon, something simple, you know, bottle falls over on the table, the water pour, pours out on the ground. There's some coherence to that particular yeah, phenomenon. Yeah, it's yeah. not just pure randomness. Yeah, of course Why not. is that? Though? Do you say there are physical laws? In some that... cases, in some kind of forms of causation, the best way of accounting for causation is to refer to physical laws, even if we know that physical laws are abstractions, are, you know, always complex. I mean, when you apply a physical law to the concrete world, never works perfectly because there are and a gigantic amount of variables that you cannot account for. But it's a good approximation. So if you talk about a bottle that falls, the best thing is to refer to gravity or these things. No doubt about that. So going down this train of thought here, when we're talking about laws of physical reality, we have, and the way that I see it, we have our conceptions of the laws, we have our mental explanations of the law of gravity and so on, and then those conceptions have amazing explanatory power for explaining all kinds of phenomena. And I think the reason for that is because those conceptions we have map onto the world loosely. Not going to be perfect, right? Newton's law is not perfect, but it's a very, very good approximation. But those law, those physical laws separate of our conception of them that we're trying to get a, a clear conception of, what is their ontological status? What what are those things like? Are they in the world? Are they in some kind of a super system mm -hmm. that, you know, outside of the world that somehow structures it? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems that on the background of this question, there is the old metaphysical idea that we should have a unitary view of reality. That's the one important uh, goal of philosophy. I think uh, that one that doesn't work. So originally people tried to think in theological terms and then mechanical terms. Now they have other. So everything has to uh, have a very simple explanation in principle, simple as a the scientific theory can be. Uh, I think that's uh, misguided. Uh, so of course science is the most important uh, uh, cognitive tool we have and does spectacular things. But science itself, there is no such a thing as science. There is no such a thing as the scientific view of the world, even nowadays. Uh, there are, you know, growing, uh, there is growing evidence that chemistry cannot be reduced to physics in an interesting sense. And of course, biology, I repeat, uh, they express, so how can you even in principle, principle think that, you know, there's, there is something like uh, the potential explanation of uh, uh, natural selection referring to uh, subatomic entities. I don't even know what this is, if not it's, you know, a crazy dream. So science itself is very plural, and not to mention the mm. social and human sciences. Uh, so uh, sociological, uh, like the birth of capitalism, as you know, was studied by uh, Max Weber and others, can we really, this is his, uh, his explanation, so let's assume that is vaguely correct, his connection with Calvinism, probably is not entirely correct, but he has a point there. And so this point could in principle be translated to a physical, uh, uh, rendered in physical, with the physical co concepts of physics. I don't think that makes any sense, honestly. Not even in principle. But what is in principle here? I mean, if we had, you know, 10,000 years in the future, 100,000 no, years no, in the future. No, 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 no. That's a, the more, many of these problems are non-polynomial. So when you go to calculate these uh, connected things, if you have to make the calculation, think about this. We know from physics, from Newtonian physics, that the three problems 
uh, Poincaré three problems problem, uh, um, uh, three th three bodies problem, right? If we have three bodies, it's in principle cannot be calculated what the uh, movements of these three b bodies that uh, have are in a gravitational relationship is in principle. So we start from that. But so. What is in principle real here? It's a, a philosophical dream. Let's try to, you know, to, to think that I think the best contribution of contemporary metaphysics is to let's abandon these big dreams and let's look. I don't, I think it meta, it, it's right the metaphysics, I'm happy the metaphysics is back in the debates, was abolished by the linguistic term, it's back legitimately, but it has to, you know, to think differently, really. So if there are multiple causal explanations for phenomena that aren't reducible to one another, still though, what is the ontological status of those causal things? So it, causality is an explanatory tool, but is, it, is there any um, correlate in reality of any form? The, the physical causality we have a concept of, but is the concept yeah, I mean, referent to when actual you, When something? you refer to physical events, is the physical events. When you refer to why people do things intentionally, what the reasons are, these are the mental uh, con reasons, the mental uh, states that contributed to this, to these actions are the the reference and or the our explanations there are i don't think there is a unifying um, metaphysical structure of everything so let me ask you if if there are different causal phenomena that can't be reduced to one another does that do, are all of those different causal phenomena also and ha, do they also have their own metaphysical and ontological status i mean it depends how you define again if you have an idea that don't know this is debate right of for example one debate nowadays a new one is uh, uh, is there only one sense of existence? Mm -hmm. You know, remember, famously, Aristotle said that existence is said in many ways. Being is said in many ways, right? And then, you know, in modern times, Quine came out with this ontological commitment principle and blah, 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 criterion. Uh, and so there was the idea uh, being is the value of a bounded uh, variable and blah blah in a uh, you know in a in a theory that is regimented and first uh, order logic all these ideas of that is existence i think this is impoverishing the world really and it doesn't work that way also for technical reasons uh doesn't really work for first order logic is not really good in translating our best theories about the world but also and that's the main point that Patam take from pragmatism. What are our best theories? We have to explain why you are here now. Why should we use um, quantum mechanics or the theory of evolution? I don't think so. These are not our best theories for, uh, you know, for explaining wh why you are here. I don't think there is in principle a theory that would explain everything. I don't think that uh, can be believed. So, in your worldview, you have physical causality, physical type of existence? You have mental causality, mental type of yeah, existence. Yeah, I'm a pluralist, yes. Or what are the other ones? Is, do you have a spiritual causality, spiritual type of I mean, of uh, that's much more difficult. I tend to be a na liberal naturalist here. Um, so it depends on how you define a spirituality. If spiritual, like Patrick thought of spirituality, something connected with the internal mind, mm -hmm. um, not with, you know, s phenomena that are in contradiction with the scientific world or miracles or these things. It, talked in this way, spirituality, in this sense, I think spirituality has a place in the world. But again, the attempt to reduce all these phenomena to ontology, to an ontological explanation. Uh, what are there other ontological, so when you say you're a pluralist, how big is your I mean, your for set? example, I moderately tend to accept the idea that there are abstract entities. Abstract entities are a different ontological status by, from materials. You entities. mean like numbers or concepts? Yeah, or? yeah. This, yeah, well, some of this can, of course, be taken for real for several reasons, right? For um, They have an existence that is not our kind of existence and not sp space-time. Also, I think there are agents, but there are organisms that are not just uh, the sum of their cells or their molecular, the molecular hmm. that really compose them. So, they're, ex well, so what are they? Uh, what, when you, that's interesting. When you organisms? Have like a, like what or is agents? It is the organism... Is an existence in addition to its physical constituent particles? Yeah, of course. Here, there are also the all day, but I don't think the the properties. Sometimes, frequently, agents have properties that cannot be translated in the properties of the physical constituents. So, if you want to call this uh, different um, 
uh, a different ontological entity do it. What I doubt is that there is something that, you know, we have that, 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 hey, this is the ontology of the world, one big consistent picture. Uh, I think this is more of a dream. So you have a very big um, pluralistic framework. Yeah, but that's very dangerous to say that there is one big pearl okay. realist, right? Because it's the that idea there. That you have, one. Because at that point, yeah, you have a, you know everything fits well with. It. I don't think it, everything fits well because you know uh, subatomic particles fit in a way in which agents that you know pr make decisions because they uh, decided that they don't like Trump for that. Uh, that it's not really they don't fit well together. It's different ways, different perspectives on the world. I'm curious. This is this would be such a good place to say, oh, it's a great place to end. But I got to ask you another question because this is a really interesting worldview that I, I haven't heard before. Because everybody, like myself, we want to cram everything into one big ontology. Like we can do that, and it leads to all kinds of problems. So when you try to explain the existence of the world in its um, radically, it's like puzzle pieces that don't fit together. What's your explanation for? for that, that just the universe is that way or is there even such a thing as the universe i mean uh, can you give even so i see what you mean so do you say if i can translate there is this craving for a unitary explanation certainly there is but i think sometimes we have to resist to our you know we are basic desires the explanations of the supposed unity are always very unsatisfactory or uh, People now, but they interact. These different threads of existence all interact with one another, though, don't they? No, they interact. But if you have the idea that you know how can this entity interact in a ontological sense, then you have a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. But if you take the idea that you have different perspective on the world, uh, and you consider some parts of the world, some forms uh, in the Aristotelian sense instead of others, depending on what you are interested in, things fit better. But is there is no way of unifying the world in which you know. There is the ontological uh, correspondent of uh, uh, intentional explanations. There is the ontological correspondent of biological explanation, then physical explanation, and then it's there. It, it, these are the properties. These are the levels. These are. The, I don't. I don't find this very promising, honestly. Do you think that there is uh, something? Like the universe is that even a term that's just yeah? A, but a, even we look at physics; they don't even know if there are mm, there is an infinity of universes. So yeah, we can dream about everything here, but this is really I would assume that there is such a thing. But it's uh, what it is. It's you know, let's let's leave to the physici physicists to talk about the physical universe. I think as a philosopher, I don't think I'm entitled to add much to what they say. This has been great. I really appreciate you taking the time and talking with me. Thank you very much. All right, that was my interview with Professor Mario DeCaro. Yes, the Mario DeCaro who has an asteroid named after him. Hope you guys enjoyed it and found it provocative. I certainly did. As rare as dualists are, pluralists are even rarer. So I got a lot of really exciting things coming up in 2017 I'll be sharing with you over the next couple of weeks after the release of my latest book, Square One, The Foundations of Knowledge, which you can pick up on Amazon. I've had more time to shoot videos and writing some articles, so check out my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash stevethought, and I have started again posting weekly videos there. So that's all for today. I'll talk to you guys next week.